Yeah, right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our focus online, lecture 142 and glaucoma session 46. And we are in our international masterclass series. And we welcome Professor Tariq Sharavi of all the way from Switzerland. And he'll be talking on BLEP complications in glaucoma, or as he likes to say, the BLEP site. And I would request Dr. Vanita Patakrev, ma'am, to please introduce her. Thank you very much, Rolika. And as usual, it's a great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker tonight, evening for him. Uh, and yet again, Team Center for Science have the good fortune to bring you another glaucoma specialist who needs no introduction to any ophthalmological audience worldwide. But nonetheless, it gives me great pleasure to introduce him to our future ophthalmologists. Dr. Tariq M. Sharawi is the head of the glaucoma unit and the glaucoma uh, research, surgery research group at the University of Geneva Hospitals. And um, he obtained both his medical uh, bachelor and master's degree in ophthalmology at the University of Cairo and his doctorate of medicine from the University of Lausanne in Switzerland. He uh, trained in ophthalmology initially at the Cairo Research Institute of Ophthalmology and completed two glaucoma fellowships at the universities of Lausanne and Basel respectively. He's currently the president of the International Society of Glaucoma Surgery, as well as the associate vice president of the World Glaucoma Association. He is a surgeon par excellence. And I had the good fortune to share the, share the same stage with him in a recent webinar organized by the Middle Eastern Ophthalmic Society. And it is little wonder then that this his main research interest is in surgical techniques of glaucoma surgery. His other interests include normal pressure glaucoma and glaucoma patterns of practice in developed and developing countries. And he has obtained several grants in the pursuit of his research interests. He's the author and editor of five textbooks of glaucoma and has more than a hundred book chapters and publications in peer-reviewed journals. He serves on the editorial board of several ophthalmology journals, which include uh, Journal of Glaucoma, International Journal of Ophthalmology, the Canadian Journal of Ophthalmology, Middle East, African Journal of Ophthalmology, being of few. He has, to his credit, several visiting faculty invitations, including the universities uh, in Spain, Turkey, Hong Kong, South Korea, Kuwait, Etc., etc., etc. He has uh, delivered numerous other invited keynote lectures elsewhere. And in addition to his glaucoma practice, Dr. Tariq Sharavi is uh, very active in a number of NGOs that deal with global prevention of blindness. With these words, I would like, I would like to, as well as team. Center for Sight, extend a very warm welcome to him to deliver his lecture today on uh, blood complications in diploma. Professor Tariq Sharabi. Thank you so much, Vanita, for the um, such uh, kind words from you. Um, uh, I also have enjoyed sharing the webinar with you recently, and I and can attest to having learned a couple of tricks from, from your work. Uh, my relationship with India is, is deep and old and goes back a couple of decades. I have been influenced by uh, masters from India, by uh, exceptionally good scholars and academians from your beautiful country. I have visited many times and I have organized the International Congress of Glaucoma Surgery in New Delhi many, many years ago, and it was one of the most beautiful meetings that we have organized. Uh, I have incredibly beautiful memories, and, um, and it was the, high, the highest attended meeting in the history of ICGS ever. Um, and uh, I am looking forward to having the opportunity to visit India soon. Uh, lots of uh, places that are close to my heart and a few restaurants that I would like to pay uh, another visit to. 
So uh, with that, I don't want to uh, waste too much time. I will share my screen. And I will speak to you today about something that is relatively close to my heart, which is managing special complications, as, as special complications related to glaucoma surgery. I think I would not like to use this uh, valuable time of yours to show you some fancy stuff and show uh, <clears throat> how good a surgeon I am. Uh, I think uh, Vanita uh, spoke very highly of, of me and I don't, I'm not so sure that I, res I, that I deserve that. But what I would like to share with you are difficult situations, um, especially related to uh, post-operative period after operating glaucomas. So we start with a small chart of everything that is available now in terms of uh, glaucoma surgery. Those are all devices or operations that are CE marked in Europe or FDA approved in America. A lot of you practice many of those, but very few people practice all of them. And uh, if you look at it for the first instance, it looks like a, a mixed salad of different things. And I would like to start first by trying to explain what we have now, creating some sort of a common ground or a kind of classification on which we can then uh, discuss what we're going to discuss. Now, all types of glaucoma surgeries uh, rely on utilizing one of the following strategies, either you know, filtering into the subconjunctival space or making a better use of the conventional outflow pathway by um, tweaking it in a way that it would be working that it would work better in, in, in glaucomatous cases. One other way is going the suprachoroidal uh, channel and, uh, and uh, suprachoroidal space and opening the strategic reserve of filtration or of, of outflow in our eyes. And finally, we can always close the tap, as you can see here, and um, in essence, destroy the ciliary body. Any of those four strategies can be applied or approached from inside the eye, ab internal, or from outside the eye, ab external. <clears throat> but many of those still, unfortunately, rely on creating a bleb. Most of the operations around the world nowadays, the vast majority, relies on creating a bleb. This bleb could be above a device, like a, above a, a, one of the uh, tubes or implants that we use, or it could be after a trabeculectomy, the most utilized operation in glaucoma surgery or uh, after a deep screctomy. And in fact, we look at our blebs in O and we look at them as if we have uh, created a wonderful thing. When in fact, we are actually creating an insult on the eyes, on the otherwise perfect topography of, uh, of the eyes of our patients. So instead of uh, giving them a solution, we maybe reduce the pressure with those operations in many cases, but then we create different types of uh, complications and different types of worries for our patients. First thing that you need to know about glaucoma surgery is that the choice of the operation <clears throat> depends among other things about what kind of conjunctiva you are handling. So I always try to mobilize the conjunctiva using the lid or actually using a cotton bud after anesthetizing the surface of the conjunctiva and trying to move a little bit the conjunctiva. This is absolutely mandatory. Going into the operating theater without knowing what conjunctiva you are managing is like you know, uh, uh, trying to operate in the dark. It's that bad. I also do uh, hydro dissection as the first step of most of my operations. And I think it is a vital and necessary step in all glaucoma process. It's not just because you want to dissect the conjunctiva away from the sclera to be able to, to perform your operation, but it more importantly, it is a way to identify what kind of conjunctiva that you're going to face. Is it thin? Is it atrophic? Is it avascular? Is it scarred? 
uh, you can do the most brilliant operation and you end up in a catastrophe if you are unable to cover it well with the conjunctiva. So it is very important to immediately know what kind of conjunctiva you're handling that can change completely the strategy that you are using for your operation. Obviously, the, I'll go back here just a second to, to, to demonstrate that I would never dream of holding the conjunctiva with anything else but a serrated forceps like that. People, I, I sometimes see surgeons using a colibri to, to hold the conjunctiva or a tying forceps or whatever. Conjunctival tissues are valuable and are precious and we should not destroy it or damage it. So it is very important to handle with care. <coughs> Many years ago, I have uh, designed the speculum. Unfortunately, I have no financial interest in it, but it basically has two knobs on each plate of the speculum. And those knobs help you to attach the 8O vicryl uh, corneal suture that would allow you a very good exposure of the eye and stability during surgery. It is a very simple gimmick. I'm sure that any Indian company can copy that and, and, and sell it for 10% of the price and with a better quality. And you can see it gives you a huge and very wide exposure uh, for you to, to operate. Every time you operate, when the lid margins are cramming or are uh, squeezing your field, you are not going to be comfortable. Comfort in an operation is key. Comfort starts by sleeping well the night before, sitting well behind the microscope uh, and resting your arms in the way that you would like to rest. All those are small steps that would allow you to get a good result from your operation. And I do not, not ever underestimate the importance of you being comfortable and obviously in a good mood while you're operating. So are all blebs born bad? I would say that some blebs are born relatively well. You can see this is a bleb that for me is decent. It is not too high. It is diffuse. It is relatively well vascularized. And um, it is has been ongoing for six years. So this is, and you can see even microcysts on the surface of the bleb indicating that it is functioning. This is the dream bleb and patient is comfortable with it. We are comfortable because, because the patient is comfortable. But unfortunately, not all blebs are exactly similar. This is another bleb. This is a posterior bleb. After a trabeculectomy, all the filtration is happening uh, five millimeters perhaps from the limbus. All that really is looking quite good. And those are uh, blebs that are associated with excellent longevity. Now, not all blebs are, are that good. And there is a terminology or a term that has been introduced in the glaucoma literature maybe 15 or 20 years ago, dysthesia or bleb dysthesia. Dysthesia is discomfort or abnormal sensation in the eye. Uh, and it comes from the, the etymology comes from the word, from the two Greek words, this meaning discomfort or bad and sthesis, which means sensation. So it's a bad uh, uh, sensation in the eye. And blepdesthesia happens in 15, and some sources even speak about 20% of cases after trabeculectomy or deep sclerectomy or tubes developing discomfort in the eye. Uh, those blebs are, are in many cases um, not at all comfortable for our patients and they come in different shapes. How to manage those bad blebs? Well, you can try aggressive lubrication. You can use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drops. You can use big diameter bandage contact lenses. And to be honest with you, if the bleb is really bad, all that rarely would work. When you construct the bleb itself, you, it is very important to be able to, uh, to construct it in the right way. This is a conjunctiva that is, has retracted during surgery and I'm unable to pull the conjunctiva 
backwards. And my trick here is to try to start the, the, the ligature or the uh, suturing back and then towards the limbus. As you can see here, we, we can cover it in, in, in a decent way, but that was not good enough. So we decided to have an autologous part of the uh, free uh, conjunctival flap and to tie it uh, on top of, the, of this area. You should not leave the eye with a part of the bleb not going to, not, not fully covered. Some surgeons, especially young surgeons, they would leave a millimeter or, or so and uh, pray that the, the conjunctiva will grow to close the, the, the defect. That's, that never happens. So you can pray as much as you like. If you haven't done your homework well, you're not going to succeed in the exam. You can see here this uh, flap is very well compressed on top of the uh, of the dissection, making sure that there's nothing that is coming out. Now, I would actually differentiate between two types of, of blebs. There are the blebs that are big and fat. And uh, you can see here, those are examples of those big and fat blebs. <coughs> and <coughs> those big and fat blebs are again, something that you should not accept. Um, my best tool for big and flat and uh, big and fat blebs is the uh, Palmberg sutures. You can put 10 O Palmberg sutures to uh, compartmentalize those blebs and compress. So compress and create compartments within them. And you can sometimes also inject some autologous blood to create some sort of scarring. Obviously, something like that is not, you know, you are not we are not engineers. You're not going to put a specific number of, uh, of, of sutures and a specific volume of blood to end up with a pressure of 14 and a half. It doesn't work like that. It's very artisanal. It is based on a lot of, of experience and a lot of good fortune. So uh, don't hesitate, but don't be dismayed by the fact that unfortunately, uh, bleb corrective um, procedures like those are not bulletproof or are not extremely accurate. Having said so, I have never really uh, been hugely disappointed with a maneuver like the Palmberg sutures. Uh, most of my patients report an improvement of their discomfort, of their dysthesia immediately in the first post-operative day, they will come back and say, I don't know what you've done, but my eyes feel better. And I don't understand the mechanism of how fast or why is it that fast for them to have an improvement of their, of their sensation. It, it, it totally escapes me, but I'm just sharing with you what I have seen. The other type of blebs, to make it simple, that I, that I uh, like to, uh, to term ugly and dangerous. So ugly and dangerous blebs, like this bleb, are atrophic, are avascular, are blebs that are associated with leaks, as you can see here. And with a bit of fluorescein, uh, you can clearly understand uh, what kind, let me just move a little bit. You can kind of see that those blebs are leaking. Every, any bleb that, le that, that uh, allows aqueous to come out would also allow microbes to come in. So those blebs are not acceptable. Look at this bleb. I'm looking under or behind the slit lamp and I see a very small filtration or, or leak within the bleb doesn't look very good, but uh, I'm also very careful to understand if there's any other site of leak. And all of a sudden I discover another site just beside it, which is, as you can see, humongous. So obviously this is a guy with a hypotony, with a hypotonic maculopathy and the reduction in vision. You will not be able to leave a bleb like, a bleb like that. And this is a dead bleb. All of it is scarred. All of it is avascular. So the decision here was to basically excise the whole bleb, as you can see. And from there on, it was not too difficult to uh, pull down the conjunctiva, create a decent bleb. And uh, so far, we've been living uh, happily ever after. This is another bleb of a guy whose pressure is nine, a bit of choroidal uh, folds. 
and I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking, and I don't see anything coming out. So I'm asking myself, is there a supracoroidal cleft? I put the gonioscopy lens, I found, I found nothing. So I went back to the blip again, decided to take a, a second go, a second go, I try to find if there's anything that is leaking. So as you can see here, we are again, putting a little bit of pressure this time on the, or on, the, on the globe. And all of a sudden, you can see oozing rather than leaking. So it's enormous amount of acres that's coming out. And here's a lesson to be learned. Always apply a little bit of pressure on the globe before you decide if something is coming out or not. For this bleb, we decided to uh, work it out in a different way. I will advance a little bit the video. We actually decided to again do a hydro dissection uh, and we are injecting a balanced salt solution under the bleb. The patient here is anesthetized with 5% cocaine eye drops. And you can see, I'll stop here for a second. You can see this whole area is decent conjunctiva and all this area is dead. So the decision this time, because the bleb is not all of it is damaged, I decided to basically remove the roof of this bleb. So as you can see here, we decide to uh, basically excise very meticulously only the, the, the conjunctiva and take nothing underneath the conjunctiva. So you can see I'm taking all this area, leaving the rest of the conjunctiva almost intact as you, um, I'm sorry, the rest of the bleb almost intact. And now it is, it, it is upon us or it's our responsibility to create a new roof. And with that, again, I'm using an 8.0 vicryl. Take good note of the conjunctival forceps that I'm using and that the needle is rounded, 8.0 vicryl, and I'm doing a purse string. You can see I'm trying to close it as tightly as possible. So we close on one side and then we go ahead and close on the other side, making sure that the conjunctiva is fully co-opted on the limbus and then testing at the end of surgery to make sure that no leak is happening. I'm tightening, I'm tightening. And uh, it, it's a good trick to close from one side and then tighten from the other side to be able that, uh, and don't worry about astigmatism, it will happen. But, the, but, but it will go away uh, a few weeks after that. It's not going to be a permanent astigmatism. From the, and this is how the bleb looks like in the first post-operative day. And this is, I think, uh, four weeks after. You can see that, the, that there's nothing that is coming out. Or there's no leak whatsoever. The patient has a pressure of 11 for the past year and uh, a vision of 100%. I want to share with you the story of this patient of mine, a very decent and nice uh, gentleman, a big, by the way, a big scholar of uh, Indian archaeology by chance. And this guy came to me and said that he is not happy uh, because after the operation, he started noticing that his eye is speaking to him. Uh, you get tempted when you hear things like that from your patients to um, brush them aside and say, well, you know, the guy is obviously becoming too senile, uh, send him to a psychiatrist. Uh, but I like to give my patients always the benefit of the doubt. And I like to think of myself as a person who listens well to his patients. So I decided to go to a friend of mine who's a sound engineer and we work together on trying to record if there's a real sound coming from the eye after the operation or not. And so he created for me, as you can see here, a, a mini audio studio to, to engulf the eye and to try to record whatever sound that comes out of the eye. Uh, he actually could catch a signal that he then worked uh, digitally to amplify it. So I would like you to hear now the amplified sound of a bleb. Uh, so I guess for the very first time, you would be able to hear uh, the, a bleb code.
so that is basically a sound of the bleb as it moves while the lid, while the patient is blinking. So every time he blinks, there is a sound that comes. It's very faint, but he can hear it. And it was driving him mad. So we basically did a few Palmberg sutures. And uh, thankfully, the, the sound disappeared. Uh, interestingly enough, the patient came back and said that he started to feel lonely without the sound of the bleb. But for that, I could not really give him much advice other than uh, to perhaps get married again. Uh, needling of a bleb that is scarred is very dangerous. We do it a lot, and some people would needle six or seven times. Uh, I'm not really big on that. I needle once or twice maximum. And remember that this is one of the most dangerous operations that we're doing because basically we are working in the dark. We are blindly trying to cut into something. Sometimes it works really well. Sometimes it doesn't work at all. Sometimes it works and then scars very fast. I'm not saying that I'm against needling, but I think that we should, um, we should regulate needling and not continue to needle forever. So... Once, maybe twice maximum, this, is, this would be my personal recommendation, though I always accept uh, that what I am saying might not be uh, acceptable to everybody. This is a, a blip that was needled and uh, in a deep sclerectomy, and the iris jumped into the operative site, basically because we don't do an iridotomy or an iridectomy with deep sclerectomies. So once it has a space, it can jump in and it can prolapse. <clears throat> and that is a, a very nasty complication that needs, in most cases, a re-intervention. Deep sclerectomy blebs are usually better than trabeculectomy blebs. And that is mainly because we do, as you can see here, a very deep dissection, taking a, a deeper part of the, um, of the sclera which would allow us to have an intrascleral space, what we call an intrascleral bleb. So not all of the bleb is happening subconjunctively. Some of the bleb is happening intrasclerally. We come back to all that we have spoken about in terms of all those kinds of operations, and we ask ourselves, is there really a, a light at the end of the tunnel? Well, there might be some light at the end of the tunnel in terms of new procedures like the mini jet from iStar that actually injects an implant into the supracoroidal space, as you can see here, allowing filtration without a bleb. Interesting, but time will only tell if this is the thing that we need. But there's also some, already some brighter skies. If you see what we call the hybrid blebs, blebs that are related to things like the Zen or the micro shunt. You can see here the micro shunt is going somewhere in the uh, subconjunctival space, far away, it's filtering far away from the limbus, and it will give you this kind of a bleb. It's a bleb that is, as you can see, shallow. It is a bleb uh, that is far away, posterior, and relatively well vascularized, and they are more comfortable for our patients compared to post-trabeculectomy or post deep sclerectomy. Having said so, those, bleb, those devices can scar. Here you can see a bleb that is completely scarred. There's nothing coming out of it. So the good news is that we can take it into the operating room and rework it. This is the bleb in the operating room. You can see it is, again, completely buried in scar tissue and completely obstructed. Nothing is coming out. But it is not too complicated to work a bit of magic with your forceps and with your scissors to open up. As soon as you open up, you can see that the aqueous is coming out. I don't know if you could capture that, but as soon as we, we try to free this incarcerated implant, the aqueous is coming out. You can, I think you can see here that the aqueous is seeping out and, and uh, it doesn't need too much work. You have to be very gentle to take away all the fibrous strands and, and scar tissue. Um, but it is very gratifying to see that you can develop a reincarnation of, uh, of, uh, of this tube into the subconjunctival space and uh, putting a little bit of mitomycin and closing 
and uh, giving a second life for those kinds of devices. Having said so, look at this uh, device at Zen coming with an exposure. I use a, a, a tying forceps, I pull it out. And unfortunately, it leaves in its place uh, a supracoroidal cleft that needed to take the patient into the operation. Future, well, future is always bright. I am always very optimistic. In my lifetime, I started, uh, I learned trabeculectomy from Peter Watson, uh, and I'm very proud to be his student. I learned deep sclerectomy from Andre Mermo and fought for deep sclerectomy for decades. Uh, I've mingled with the best and brightest, and they have always influenced uh, my career uh, for the better. Uh, so the future, yes, it is going to be bright, and I'm optimistic. Here is the Da Vinci robot. We are using it uh, to put um as you can see a conjunctival uh, flap a conjunctival graft on top of uh, the cornea uh, you can see the absolute stability they call it a robot i call it a, a fancy playstation because at the end of the day at the end of of these uh, two magnificent uh, hands that you can see here there are two hands of a surgeon on joysticks that are actually doing the actual work and the actual operation. So uh, not sure that it is right to call it a robot. Um, it is, has been an honor uh, to be associated uh, with this series of lectures, 142 lectures. My God, this is a bank of some of the best educational material I've ever heard. 46 glaucoma lectures. I mean, what else can we ask for? Uh, the Indian ophthalmology has gifted the world with a series like no other. Uh, I'm also very proud to be associated with Indian ophthalmology over the past 25 years, uh, learned a lot um, and enjoyed an enormous hospitality and uh, lots of honors. So uh, I'm really hoping that uh, soon I will be able to be again in your most beautiful country that is always very close to my heart and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, um, <laughs> Dr. Sharavi. Ray, you know, it was a wonderful exhibition of uh, your uh, beautiful surgery, really with a lot of patience and um, uh, with a lot of thought, I would have thought. Um, at this point, I would uh, invite uh, Dr. Harsh and Dr. Pratip for their uh, impressions and questions, if they may have any, and then we would go on and discuss a few questions from our uh, future ophthalmologists as well, the budding ones. Thank you, Vanita and uh, Tarek. That was absolutely marvelous. I think, I think we all have learned a lot and I must say that actually we learn more than the <laughs> PGs and the students because uh, only when you have done thousands of surgeries, then you can understand the intricacies. And uh, I'm uh, very, I think I'm really appreciate the way you uh, make us hear the sound because you rightly said sometimes we just don't listen to what the patients say because we just don't know what's going on over there. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> just a couple of points, I think very beautifully he said one thing which must all PGs and at least the people who are going to do the surgery must understand that pre-operatively you must look at the conjunctiva the way he showed you. But more than that, you know, especially Tarek in India, there is a surgery known as SICS. And it is so beautifully this cataract surgery is done where uh, you will not see anything at all. It's only when you open up the conjunctiva there and you realize that there's a huge scar in the sclera all around and you can't, can't just do the uh, any trabeculatomy over there and you end up doing a valve. So uh, please ask the patient a hundred times whether what surgery for cataract has been done because sometimes it's practically impossible. And uh, he was definitely telling us that you have to have a good sleep the day before and uh, the, I will just uh, put it in right words that the sleep must not be induced by something else which will give you a hangover. <laughs> <laughs> so that is very important. 
and uh, uh, one or two points that uh, Tarek, I, I don't know if you have seen some of these lectures, but uh, in the laser lecture, I have shown a couple of lasers in which we paint the bleb uh, <coughs> with gentian violet, or you can use any dye. And then we give large burns like we give in gonioplasty with any coagulative laser, especially the agar. And then that can actually uh, uh, sort of uh, scar out the bleb in a way in which you don't have to take the patient into the OT, and especially for some of the larger blebs where we were giving the sutures and all. So maybe once, uh, sometimes you can have a look over there and uh, try it out if you feel like it. And uh, uh, another point I just wanted to check with you because many a times, uh, initially, if we just pull up the conjunctiva and you give whatever sutures you want to give, it will drag. So I learned that uh, art that at least from uh, way behind uh, when you're doing the bleb repair, you should give some relaxing incisions in the conjunctiva, which really help us so that you leave the conjunctiva at the limbus relaxed so that the sutures are there just holding it and not actually tightening it. So uh, I would love to hear your opinion on these points. So Ash, thank you very much for the kind words. Um... Uh, and I will definitely take a look at uh, your lecture on lasers. That uh, is uh, something that is crucial for me. Uh, you, most of you know me as a, a, a surgeon working in Switzerland, and there is another aspect of my professional career that is not very well known. I actually also operate in our non-profit uh, uh, a hospital in the south of Egypt in Aswan on a monthly basis. So I am 12 to 14 times a year operating in Egypt. And uh, I look at you as, as teachers because a lot of what you do, I can uh, transfer to my country, to Egypt. And, uh, and uh, you, you will be surprised at the influence of Indian ophthalmology on a country like Egypt uh, over the, the last couple of decades. So I would definitely look at your laser procedure and I'm sure that would help me. I'm not, I, I, when I'm operating in Egypt, my operative time is very limited because I'm, I'm traveling. So I cannot take everybody that I want to take into the operating room. So if I can uh, get away with, with working on a lab without having to go into the operating theater, then that would be a, a definite um, uh, plus. So thank you very much, Hush, for teaching me that. As as it uh, as for blebs uh, and uh, and pulling the conjunctiva, I cannot agree with you more. If it is not relaxed, if it is if you force the conjunctiva and close it with force, it will retract. Totally agree with you. And in that case, a releasing sutures or sorry, releasing incisions is a very clever way of managing it. And you don't have to have a releasing incision that is that is full thickness. You can just release the superficial part. So even leaving the tenon to be able to produce something to close, and then it will help you uh, close the conjunctiva better. And if it, and even if that doesn't work, then a, a, a conjunctival free flap or a hinged flap might help you. But I agree completely with you that um, that that you know uh, pulling. And uh, forcing anything that happens with force doesn't really work. You have to 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 coax. You have to romanticize the the, the conjunctiva into acceptance to come with you. It is not. Uh, I mean, anything that you force the conjunctiva to do, the conjunctivas are have ve are very hard headed, and we end up in catastrophe. So thank you for your for your pointers, and I accept them with a lot of respect. Prati, please. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Tariq. It was really a wonderful lecture and uh, uh, we all enjoyed it thoroughly and we learned a lot. Uh, it is more important for us because uh, we do practice trabeculectomy more than anyone else on this planet. Uh, the simple reason is that, that uh, in our population, the presenting IOP is very high and we always have to target the IOP very low. Number two is that, that in our population, the angle cruiser glaucoma is more prevalent uh, and we operate more angle cruiser glaucoma as compared to the primary open angle glaucoma. So obviously the trabeculectomy becomes the 
the choice of the surgery. But as you narrated uh, very correctly that, you know, we have to nurture the trabeculectomy very, very nicely. Then only we get the good result often. But otherwise, we'll end up in varieties of troubles. And what you have shown is, uh, is very correct. A uh, couple of uh, points which I would like to make uh, on your lecture is that, that uh, one is the Pomberg sutures. So we have tried in many patients, uh, but once the bleb shrinks, the suture again becomes the loose. And once the suture becomes loose, again, the patient comes to you with lots of irritation, foreign body sensation. And if you remove the sutures, then again, the bleb comes up, it pops up again. So that is the one problem uh, which I have noticed often in my cases, but still I do practice uh, what we call the compression sutures. Uh, autologous blood we have tried in n number of patients, but I don't know it. It never worked in my hands, so I I don't know what is your experience. You have showed that uh, beautiful video, uh, so we also do practice that, uh, but it rarely works or it hardly works. Regarding the needling of the blade, uh, I have done so many, but uh, again, as you said correctly. Uh, if you have to uh, be a successful, then probably in one or two attempt, uh, you are successful. Otherwise, uh, it is very, very difficult to raise the blame. But uh, obviously, yes, uh, the success of the trabeculectomy lies Thank you very much. It was a great learning. Thank you, Pratip. It's uh, very kind of you. And... Uh... I would maybe ask you to dispense with the professor. Tarek is good enough. Uh, now, um, you spoke about polymer compressing sutures. I, I understand what you're saying, but my trick is to use a 10-0 and to very, very, take, take your time into doing a very tight suturing. Really take your time. And if it breaks, continue to do it again and again till you get something, I mean, intraoperatively that is very tight. The whole thing, that happens with the Palmberg sutures uh, is that it's, it creates a sort of a cheese wiring. The way we cut Swiss cheese with a wire, you basically, with time, those sutures become embedded within the bleb and they penetrate the bleb. So with time, you, see the, you don't see them on the surface. You see them deep within the bleb. And this, these are the Palmberg sutures that would work. They are not in that position after a month or two and not deep within, then their chances of success are very low. Uh, the autologous blood injection by itself never works. I totally agree with you. I use it only as complementary to Palmberg sutures. But I, as you said, I tried to inject it in many cases in the beginning of my career. I was very disappointed. You speak about... Uh, about uh, Needling, uh, and I, I, I think we, we are in agreement. Needling is something that you should not practice indefinitely. And then you uh, draw our attention to something that is very, very important. Uh, you say that you have a lot of anger closures. I know that you do. And um, some of the best epidemiological studies are coming from India. Uh, and some of the best uh, evidence for or against and iridotomy comes from India. Um, and we know from Indian studies that the morbidity of anger closures are much higher than open anger. So, so those are much more difficult cases to, to handle. Uh, I have been influenced uh, a lot by literature coming from India, and they also have been influenced by working with Dennis Lam in Hong Kong on a lot of difficult anger closures within uh, uh, Asian population. And uh, it was marvelous to have an experience to work there as a, as a visiting faculty. It was uh, one of the best times of my life, actually. And uh, I, what I have learned, and I think you might agree with me, is that you don't need to see a cataract to remove it with anger closures. You don't need to smell a cataract, but you need to uh, go for a, a phaco or removal of the lens every time you can. I have completely stopped doing trabeculectomies in phacic eyes. Uh, I don't know your opinion about that. I would like to ask you for your experience, but uh, uh, I have completely stopped doing trabeculectomies in phacic eyes. I have, uh, I have also had 
maybe 15 to 20 years ago, uh, incredible troubles with putting an express in a fake eye for anger closure. A lot ended with malignant glaucomas. It was not happy, it was not good time. But my question is, do you uh, go for removal of the lens before you do a trabeculectomy or do many of you do trabeculectomies in fake eyes? Yes, uh, uh, we, we definitely, we do the trabeculectomy in the fake eyes. And uh, obviously most of the patients, they require uh, atropine eye drops for a pretty long time to prevent the aqueous misdirection. But uh, usually what, what we have seen, I don't have uh, any authentic data of myself to share with you. But what I have observed is that, that it works uh, pretty well, even the fake eye. But if the patient has a cataract, then obviously, yes, we do remove the cataract first. Otherwise, the clear lens extraction, we, we have not yet started practicing. And another thing, Tarek, that... Uh... All said and done, I think I, at least that is my feeling that uh, uh, the combines don't work as well as an isolated trabeculectomy. I agree. I agree. I'm so, not very much for combined these days. Yeah. So uh, yes, if you can give get away with doing a cathed, why not? But uh, in case uh, many of our cases, by the the cases which come to me, Pratip and Vanita, are far advanced. And many of them, uh, we, we would uh, rather first tackle with the high pressure part. And our fake egg, this thing do uh, pretty well. So we are pretty comfortable unless the chamber is very, very shallow. Yeah, this is, this is a, a, a very interesting discussion. And um, I think we have to also agree that probably the anger closure disease in India is not similar to the ones that we are seeing in Europe. A lot of cases... When we do, a, when I do a trabeculectomy and anger closure in a fake eye, I end up with uh, shallow antechambers with the potential for malignant glaucoma. Uh, it, it's, a, it's such a headache to do it in fake eyes that I personally totally abandoned it. Remember that the, the, our cases are not that advanced, in addition to the fact that the pressure is never that high in our anger closure compared to yours. Mm -hmm. I would actually uh, slightly disagree with both uh, Dr. Harsh and Dr. Prateep. I am firm. I firmly believe that the lens has to come out in angle closure. So uh, even if I need to do a combined, I will do a combined. And I have looked at my data for combined surgery in uh, angle closure, and you know, uh, eighty percent success rate, complete success rate without medication. I think That's I will take that any day. Um, and um, even if it's just, N, you know, you know, one plus NS uh, nucleus sclerosis, I, I will take it out because uh, at the end of the day, I collect data on the lens thickness. I collect data on the lens vault as well. And when these are not acceptable, when they are relatively high, the chance of aqueous misdirection is absolutely, absolutely there. And uh, uh, repeat interventions, uh, taking the patient back again and again to the OR, you know, uh, very, very difficult in the Indian mindset, this much I can tell you. So I, I feel that we should actually um, uh, <laughs> remove the, the problem really, which is the, which is the lens. So I, I do do trabeculectomies, uh, you know, if uh, in, in fake eyes, but, you know, very few and far between. Very few and far between now. In angle closure, I'm talking about angle closure. You're not talking about open angle. Oh, but so the score is 2-2. Two, two. In the angle Sorry? closer, if we, if we get the patients with a 360 degree sinical closer, then how would the lens removal will help you? It's a very good question. But it's not about just... Uh, um, just seeing it preoperatively with with the gonioscopy. I have seen later on, if the lens has come out, the iris has fallen back where it, where it has appeared like a pass, like a, a yeah, cyclical I, closure. I, I, I agree with Vanita, the, the, uh, the whole dynamics and anatomy changes significantly when you remove the lens. So what you see prior to, uh, to the operation can be very different from you see what you see after doing the operation in presence of the lens. The lens, the whole lens iris diaphragm moves forward. 
And that's why I think it's safer to remove the lens. But as I said, the score is 2-2. Two, two, and, 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 <laughs> uh, and, no, but as I was no. presenting the other day at the, at the Middle Eastern uh, meeting, uh, you know, uh, I now do uh, endocycloplasty, uh, uh, phaco endocycloplasty in acute, especially in acute angle closures. And I found that it works beautifully. The angle actually opens up and I can see it instantaneously with my scope. So um, I, I'm very pleased. I've got a series now. Lovely. I'm looking forward to seeing that presented in our next meeting. The next meeting for the ICGS will be in the 20 will be on the 24th of February, 2022. Ah. So four months from now, of course, all of India, all of India is invited. We will will be our pleasure. Absolutely. Right. Well, um, I look forward to seeing you all. We do have a few questions, if you don't mind taking them. The, the first one I would ask you about needling um, is, uh, do you needle with the uh, adjuvants, with my, mitomycin C or... Yeah, I, I, I needle and at the end of the needling, I will inject 0.1 milliliter near to the superior rectus. So I not, do not inject inside the bleb, but superior to it. Okay, so you do it after, not... Yes, uh, at the, not at the end. At the end of the operation. Right, right. And uh, what about needling blebs that have been created, say, in secondary glaucomas, like, you know, uveitis or, or you know, maybe even neovascular glaucoma? Because I do tend to see, I, I would prefer to put a tube, but, you know, uh, I get uh, referred many, many patients with a trap that has failed. And then I'm in two minds, whether we should be actually giving, giving needling a chance and then moving on, or should we just, uh, just go and do a... I, I can't give you a, a, a decent answer here because I'm very biased. For all uveitic glaucomas and neovascular glaucomas, I go immediately for a tube. And uh, I don't, uh, even for blind eyes with neovascular glaucoma, uh, I would put a tube and I'm not asking you to do that. I'm just saying that this we do because the health system in Switzerland allows us to do that. And because I'm always afraid of losing the eye in a sort of a thysis or something like that. And, and, and the psychological impact of a, of a shrunken eye on our, even on our elderly patients. So I would put a valve, I would put an amid valve in, in, in most of uveitic and most of neovascular glaucoma cases. I, I don't have a, a lot of experience with needling blebs after those because I don't have those patients. But I would presume if I had a patient like that referred to me, I would not needle, I would put a valve. Okay, right. And uh, there's a question here which is asking about um, the wipeout phenomenon. Is it real <laughs> or is uh, it theoretical? Well, we you know, we, we are all from more or less uh, the same generation with the exception of Benita that is much younger than us. But, 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 but what, we, what we all have been told by our mentors and professors that there is this wipeout syndrome that will attack you during your sleep and will make your life terrible forever after. I've never seen a wipeout, but I have heard of wipeouts and I presume that wipeouts happen because of... Uh, peribulbar and retrobulbar anesthesia rather than the operation itself. Once we have moved into topical anesthesia, I don't see the wipeout happening. And after, I, I have been practicing glaucoma surgery since 1992. So since 1992, I have not seen a single wipeout. That means that it is relatively rare if we look at the number of operations that I've been doing, doing since then. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, take my career hostage because of the fear of wipeout syndrome. Uh, and, I, and, and people say, but you know, it happens in advanced cases. All of my cases are advanced. I rarely do a case that is simple. So, yeah. so I, I wouldn't uh, live in, 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 in fear or panic because of wipeout. But I also would advocate topical anesthesia for glaucoma surgery as much as, much as you can. Yes, I am doing it almost 100%. And, uh, and I feel that is why I'm able to tackle uh, very advanced glaucoma, which, you know, uh, on a 24 dash two probably don't even have a VFI, it's probably zero. Uh, these kind of patients tend to move from one specialist to another, trying to get an opinion and, you know, uh, four or five 
maybe 10 have said no, it, you know, you lose it completely. But I have seen that with topical anesthesia, you're able to maintain. So why not give them the chance? So, Vanita, uh, this, uh, uh, let me very, be very clear, and I'm sorry to say, but a lot of uh, people take them these messages right to their hearts. And a uh, lot of youngsters and people who get to do only once uh, a trabeculate me in three months, six months, or maybe a year, uh, for them, it is the best thing would be to I to be really perfectly stable. So these are people who are unable to send those patients are unable to go like Tarek was saying in the heart of Egypt and things like that, where people cannot go on to a specialist. For those kind of people, the message should be to give whatever anesthesia, but be very, very careful while giving it. Not to sure. give any kind of uh, extra massage or put a super pinky over there so that the nerve can go off. But uh, it'll be better for them and their lives and the patient to if the eye is immobile and they are in the comfortable zone while operating. Uh, I totally agree. I the the only thing is with with topical anesthesia, uh, I would not be able to do these operations except if I stabilize, stabilize it very well. That's why I showed the speculum. The speculum with an 8O vicral, it gives you super stability of, uh, of the globe and, and, and it doesn't move. But I totally agree with what you're saying. But I want to go back to Vanita because she, you touched very briefly on something that is very important. You know, glaucoma patients are, uh, for many ophthalmologists, a big headache. And uh, if they have advanced glaucomas, a lot of our colleagues, unfortunately, tend to say, if you do the operation, there's a risk of loss. We'll give you some more medications and some more medications, and the patient is bleeding the last few retinal nerve fiber cells or ganglion cells as we, as we are waiting. I think this is a betrayal to our, uh, to our role as, as healers and as, as doctors. Um, I think... Advanced cases need advanced doctors to examine. I think uh, it is such a bad, bad manners or behavior to decide to not want to take the responsibility to treat your patients because the case is difficult. So you don't treat well and you don't refer the patient and you decide to put the patient on a slow burner somewhere as the patient is being burnt. So the message is very simple here. If you are uncomfortable doing the operation rather than not having the operation done, send the patient to a senior of yours, to a colleague of yours with a better experience. But for God's sake, don't uh, decide not to operate because you are not comfortable to operate because that is basically you choosing yourself over your patient. And that for me is the worst case of the worst kind of doctors. Right. On that note, uh, can we move on to the next question? Um, we'll, uh, you know, do all bleb leaks need uh, to be sorted in the uh, OR or, you know, can they be managed conservatively? It, it, it depends on when did the leak happen. Uh, if a leak happens in the first post-operative days and it is not too bad, in many cases, with observation or with a bandage contact lens, it can heal by itself. The worst case of, of leakage is what happens six, seven, eight years down the line. Those are conjunctivas that are damaged beyond auto repair. So you have no chance, in my zero chance, in my opinion, that those would fix themselves. And if they're leaking, uh, because basically it's like it's like uh, you know a floor that is leaking in in your house. It is not going to repair itself. So you have to really do the job and, 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 and rework the roof so that it, it stops leaking. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, I had a spate of um, bleb leaks that, you know, through the conjunctiva, you could see a scleral fistula right through and through. Yeah. So um, in, in those kinds of cases, what, what, what do you like to uh, repair, repair it with? Uh, what, would, what material would you like to? Would you use a sclera full thickness? Would you use cornea? Would you use autologous uh, sclera? Very, very, that is a very clever question. And it reminds me of a case that I operated uh, like a month ago. It was a, a bleb that created a fistula 
and that uh, it was huge. So uh, I wish I could have I've had the opportunity to add this video to my presentation today, but it was not easy to do and edit at the last minute. What I did was uh, to do a partial thickness uh, flap and to you know to keep it at a at a hinge on the on the sclera and then to move it sideways to close. Right. So that is that for me is now my my preferred way to manage those cases. Before, I put a lot of tutoplast uh, on those uh, fistulas, but tutoplasts are thick and they end up having a, a cosmetically not very nice looking bleb. So I would rather use the sclera itself, have a half thickness and, and, and pull it. Some people use corneas, uh, some people use scleras, but I am happy to use the sclera of the patient, hinge it on one side and, and you know, uh, invert it. Uh, if the conjunctiva is not good and not pullable, I am been using for some time now uh, amniotic membrane prepared. Uh, it's a it's a British company. I forgot the name, but I get pieces of uh, of uh, amniotic membrane that I can use to complement my my coverage of the bleb uh, if there is a need. Right. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Tariq Sharhoi. We really enjoyed uh, interacting with you. Uh, you've been so free and frank with us. I'm sure uh, all our audience uh, will immensely benefit from, from your talk. Uh, we hope to meet you in person sometime pretty soon. Uh, we thank you for your effort, for your time. Um, and, you know, coming all the way from uh, Switzerland, we also have uh, Professor Andre Mermou uh, as, as a, a guest lecture for us, lecturer for us. So, uh, you know, I, we feel that we, we are benefiting immensely from interacting with uh, world stars related that, to that, that's that's very kind vanita i thank you very much for the honor of uh, that you bestowed upon me speaking to my peers and my colleagues from uh, your beautiful country i uh, and thank you for your your friendship and your beautiful smiles uh, it 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 makes my day uh, rich and i will go home uh, you know satisfied that i have met such a, a group of lovely people thank you very much thank you so much good night. have a good evening you too. Bye-bye. Good evening. Bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you, madam. Bye-bye.